Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kata Yoon Chamini, and I'm a biologist and educator here at the New School. And I was asked to participate in this event, um, primarily bringing my perspective, which is a biological perspective, to the idea of organizing. Um, and one of the things that we did before this um, session was to exchange some notes and some ideas with one another. And so what we're really hoping this 45 minute period will be, will be an open conversation. So it's very loosely structured um, and we hope to engage the audience as well. So I'm only gonna be speaking for a couple minutes and then I'll be followed by Kevin and Andrea and then Lydia will hopefully tie our ideas together. So it's gonna be very brief, um, but I'm just gonna highlight a few things here and there. Um, one of the things that struck me when I looked at both Theaster's work and also looking at some of the comments that Kevin made about community development was this notion of boundary blurring. Um, and to me, the way that Theaster does this, both geographically by moving things from one place to another place, both in time and in space, is very, very central to what I do in biology. Um, we move cells uh, naturally through time and space, but we also artificially move them in time and space. But one of the things that captured me about Kevin's comments was this notion of um, privilege and power. And so when we think of science often, and especially at the new school, we think of it as something in the ivory tower, something for the elite with a very specific language, with a very specific tool set that is often segregated and left to only those who have access to those tools and knowledge. And one of the things that struck me was the collaborations we do here at the new school um, with, for instance, a community organization called GenSpace. Does anybody know about GenSpace here? No one? Okay, GenSpace is part of a new movement um, here and internationally, uh, which is called do-it-yourself science. And the notion is that you actually take very sophisticated um, biological and molecular biology tools and you now open them up to the community so that the community can repurpose them and reuse them and build things that actually address the needs of the community and or the larger community, the world, so sustainable development, for instance. So right now, one of my students has worked on a, a project called um, iGEM, which takes specific genes and moves them out of genomes that they live in in nature and puts them together in new combinations to actually create sustainable products such as chairs, um, out of kombucha, um, and other kinds of things. And so to me, when I was thinking about what Kevin was talking about, community development and the Astros work with bringing things to the community and answering community needs. To me, GenSpace is a perfect example of how scientists are also trying to do this, but in collaboration with artists. So I should say that GenSpace is primarily founded by artists and scientists working in, in collaboration together. So that said, um, one of the other things that struck me was the ways in which um, things in community have to respond appropriately to community signals. And in the body, the same thing happens. So for instance, if a cell is not responding appropriately to its environment, um, it can actually create havoc in the body. And so when I looked at this particular piece that's in the show, um, the rickshaw, Karen and I were talking about how the rickshaw actually resembles and, and represents many different things. It represents movement. It, um, it, depending on its cargo, it actually has very different functions and very different purposes. And I think this is one of the things that the Astor does so well, is to contextualize things so that you suddenly see things in a very new purpose and in a very new way. Um, and this next piece here, actually is showing you how a cell responds to its environment because I think most people think about cells as these things that you know you don't really understand. But they're not unlike art objects or other things that can be moved and responding to context. So I'm just gonna show you an example of one cell and this is a schematic clearly. And this cell is responding to an environmental signal. Depending on what that environmental signal is, the cell is going to perform different functions and behave in different ways. So for instance, if you're someone who's living in a community of oppression and is experiencing microaggressions every day, that can actually influence the way in which you access your genes, express your genes, move your genes around, and the way in which the physiology of your body then manifests in pathology. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a couple examples of that. This is just one generic signal. If the signal actually was telling the cell to kill itself, we would see some reorganization inside the cell and the cell would die, uh, which is actually an important part of life, <laughs> things dying. Um, if the cell gets a signal that says, let's move to a site of infection or to address a particular um, developmental stage in life, it would be moving to that location. It can also become very specialized, like a neuron, which addresses sort of the microaggressions becoming a cognitive, but also physiological issue. Um, and then you can also create uh, division. And this is where I really wanted to focus some of my comments. So for me, I tried to think about metaphors. And I thought about the ways in which the south side of Chicago has been traditionally a marginalized community. 
and that with the Aster's efforts and many other efforts like Experimental Station and some other organizations, it's being revitalized in ways that address the community's needs. But if there was not any control and sort of back and forth communication with the community, things could get out of control. And so one of the things that's really important about the body is it's constantly in a dynamic homeostasis with itself. If for some reason things get out of control, you can actually have the development of cancer. And so I started thinking about cancer and capitalism in the same ways, right? So that capitalism can actually destroy the fabric of a community because in some ways capitalism doesn't have a limit. It doesn't respond necessarily to signals from the community. So we can look at our own economic disaster right now and the lack of response or appropriate response that's happening. And so I thought, thought about that, and I also thought about the ways um, in which the Astor said something very, very poignant to me when we were in Chicago. Um, and I'll just read you the, I think I got the quote right, the Astor. Um, you said, I don't believe everything should last forever. Some things should die, expire, and evolve into something else. And this is true in the body as well. And so I just want to show another image that really, for me, spoke volumes. And I wrote about it in the essay that will be part of this collection. Um, this piece is called In the Event of a Race Riot. And one of the things I said is that context really matters both for the cell, both for people, both for communities, you know, all those things. And I was saying that how sometimes, you know, you look at a fire hose, and most people would think of a fire hose as something rescuing you from tragedy, something that's going to support life. But when you look at the title of this piece, you realize that the fire hose can also be used to oppress people and to devalue life. Um, and so to me, that's such an important way to think about very subtle cues from context having enormous downstream effects, whether it's in the body or whether it's in a community. Um, and I just wanted to open our conversation, so I think I'll hold it there and then bounce off of the others. So I just wanted to help you understand how, as a biologist, I look at the Astor's work as not unlike how the body communicates with each other and how communities of cells are like communities of people and that community and collaboration is very important. I'm Kevin McQueen, good afternoon. I teach community development finance to graduate students here at the, uh, the New School. And I approach the Astor's work as a financier and as a strategy consultant, um, particularly in trying to f find ways of using arts and culture and creative activities to help transform uh, low income, low wealth, uh, economically isolated and disconnected communities into more uh, vibrant, uh, thriving, sustainable, and resilient uh, areas. Um, and so uh, when I think about, um, like Katyun said, when I think about capitalism, I think about you know, using uh, capitalism uh, and, and finding its limits, and, and finding its limits by channeling it to create social good. And so I, I think about you know, Theaster's work with the Dorchester Project as, as an example of, of how you can uh, take different aspects of our capitalist system and um, through the arts and through a process that was commonly referred to as arts-led economic development uh, to create something good from it and not just something that is amoral. Um, Within this context, you know, there's an entire uh, ecosystem operating that, that an artist like, like Theaster and other creative types have to uh, navigate themselves through. And that ecosystem consists of you know, a range of, of, of entities, and, and about five of them. Um, if we think about the nonprofit sector, right? So we think about um, those organizations uh, that have you know, very sophisticated leadership um, who are very skilled at, at raising resources and obtaining uh, grants and uh, contracts to deliver services um, or to uh, transform the environment through uh, developing uh, housing or uh, commercial space or community facilities. Um, another part of that, obviously, is, is the public sector and, and their role in the ecosystem in you know, providing programs and strategies that support the work of nonprofit organizations as well as local entrepreneurs and, and the corporate sector, um, and also provide incentives to financial institutions to invest in these activities. Um, third part of this community development ecosystem uh, are those financial institutions. Uh, within you know, the commercial banking sector, you know, they have a, a legal obligation called the Community Reinvestment Act to actually uh, invest in affordable housing, commercial property, uh, community facilities in the neighborhoods where they collect deposits and maintain branches. Um, 
Fourth one is the philanthropic sector, the, the range of uh, charities, uh, family foundations, uh, corporate foundations, individual venture philanthropists who uh, help uh, do the work and provide some of the, the necessary capital um, to get these uh, projects off the ground. And then the last uh, part of this ecosystem are a range of, of intermediaries, uh, both nonprofit and for-profit, that serve as um, kind of a, a trade association, kind of advocates for um, the activities that are taking place within you know, community development and, and providing a avenue for policy change. And so an artist, um, has to figure out a way to, to navigate through this ecosystem. And, and often, you know, artists don't fit comfortably within it. Um, it's, it's not, they are not conventional um, participants um, in this field. Uh, they're, they're not the ones who are showing up at meetings in, in suits and ties necessarily. Um, they're the entrepreneurial types, and it's difficult for this system to, um, to adjust and, and to serve entrepreneurs. Um, because they are unconventional and they don't necessarily follow the, the structures that are created in this ecosystem. So um, I started thinking about, uh, in looking at Theasta's work, you know, what are some uh, examples uh, here in New York City um, where we, we've seen, you know, this uh, integration of, of arts and community development um, and, and how it's played out. Um, and it's played out in three areas. One is in infrastructure. You know, one of the hardest things for, for artists in any community to find is affordable sp space uh, to make their, their, their work. Um, it's expensive to, to have gallery space or to have studio space in this city or in any major city. And, um, but there are organizations that have emerged in, in New York, like Spaceworks and Shashama, um, which are helping to take underutilized uh, public and private space and convert it into you know, temporary, temporary uses for making and exhibiting art. Um, another example is uh, the Fourth Arts uh, Block. Uh, they're, they're working on a grassroots efforts to help artists connect with affordable space. And so, um, Again, looking at the Dorchester Project, it, it, it led me to think about how um, that kind of use of underused, underutilized space in uh, low wealth, low income communities can um, be transformed uh, through the introduction of, of this kind of creative activity. In a broader sense, a broader strategic sense, is the whole idea of creative placemaking. It's a topic that um, has gotten a lot of attention, both formally and informally here in, in New York. And, you know, it's a strategy that helps, you know, cultural activities and institutions, you know, work within, you know, community to strengthen the, this whole concept of, of vibrancy and expand, you know, economic activity. But it's something that, that you know, in a formal sense doesn't really take, doesn't really uh, function well um, when it's on a standalone basis. It's something that really has to engage a range of, um, a range of actors within this ecosystem that we're talking about. Um, it has to engage not only all of those sectors that I mentioned earlier, but it also has to engage um, local residents in order for it to be uh, authentic. Um, in, in many ways, uh, placemaking um, is a very fluid process, right? It's, it's episodic. Um, it, it's improvisational. Um, and that it, it, it kind of transcends boundaries between organizations when it's done effectively. Um, but it also has the, 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 the risk and, and the consequence of um, changing the character of, of neighborhoods, right? So you know, we've seen in, in many examples where um, artists and other creative types have led uh, some transformation in communities and, you know, change the, uh, the, the character of the neighborhood and shifted the uh, people who had traditionally lived in that area out of those neighborhoods. Um, so uh, what's important is to find strategies that, that make sure we're engaging everyone in that process and um, not excluding people who um, have traditionally been marginalized uh, in our economy. And the last um, set of activities in, in New York is this 
this idea uh, at a more grassroots level of cultural organizing. Um, and we've seen it around this concept of naturally occurring cultural districts, um, which are really kind of um, that informal process of, of arts and arts communities coming together uh, to transform neighborhoods. But again, um, it's important for you know, that interaction to take place uh, in a way that channels resources, uh, both on a geographic basis and in a population basis, to make sure that we're benefiting uh, low income and, and low wealth individuals. Thanks. So, um, my name is Andrea Gaia. I'm an artist. Um, I also currently um, am running the, before I let this, this is always so fast. Let me just stop it. Um, I'm also currently the interim director of the graduate program, uh, Parsons Fine Arts. Um, I wanted to start by actually, um, I was one of the travelers that went to Chicago in winter. And I want to actually sincerely thank the Esther um, for inviting us not only um, to visit him, but into his house. I was one of the people sleeping in Black Cinema, ha cinema House. Um, and not, I know that it's part of business to invite groups and have them be part of it. So that I kind of expected that that's something somebody who does your work does. But what I didn't, um, or what I think is not so usual or at least in certain levels of this business of art and what's called social practice, um, that the sincerity with which you welcomed us and that you were actually really present um, to what this quirky group of um, new school people brought <laughs> into your space. And um, I wanted to just thank you for that because that's not really um, given in the business of art and in the business of social practice. Um, so as an artist myself, I think for me the big challenge of saying anything today was on the one hand that there are so many um, connections or ways in which um, I could think about the artist's practice, about the particular objects, about his role as an artist that I think Tony interestingly brought forward uh, in terms of career politics, um, the desire, uh, the desire machine of the art world and what it means to be engaged in that, particularly when one is deeply invested in social and political, um, I wouldn't say change, but reflection actually. And um, really, I perceive art as a, as a discipline that is not unsimilarly to uh, philosophy in the sense that it really tries to um, think itself through all kinds of different discourses, let it be um, material, let it be performative, let it be, um, um, you know, two-dimensional um, with the big questions that we're facing as a community. And in that, as artists, we, we, we speak from a community that we come from, and we always speak to a community that often exceeds the communities that we're coming from. So I'm, I'm interested in, in, I was interested in kind of trying to address that, but you know, I could be speaking for hours. The other challenge that I had in preparing for this panel is that, uh, some of you know, I'm a new parent to uh, twin boys, that every time I sit down at my computer and think, okay, I have a minute, they start crying and they start wanting my attention and they distract me. So um, it was really frustrating, especially in the last week where I'm really like, okay, I now have to get to this thing and write down things as I usually do and there was no way they would let that happen. And what it made me think about, though, um, was that what kids do and what I've been enjoying, and as many of you in this room know, is who has parents or, or around small children, is what they ask you is to be in this moment, in this moment, in this space, nowhere else. And they have a way in which they call that in um, for us that I think in our contemporary society where we're linked to screens and to everything and to thought and particularly as artists, I, I feel it's extremely hard to be truly present in this moment, in this space and let other things go and commit yourself to that. 
And so I was thinking about that, and that led me to think about um, theosis practice, but also much more at large, um, all kinds of practices. And this is where I'm going to now hit start, where these random images came from, where it was just kind of trying to, to ground myself in things that I know um, around other practices that, that theosis works as in dialogue with, um, that outwardly try to um, communicate to a com or be, build a community, be part of a community. So, but what the artwork does for me, um, and this is where the link comes with the kids, is that I think if artwork is really successful, it does something very similar. It actually asks us to be in this moment with this work right now, whatever the work is. And if we are, if I, I always think of myself, my ideal audience members, that's all I need them to be. I don't need them to know anything about art. I don't need them to know, um, you know, have read any books. All I need them to be is to allow them to be in this room and to uh, experience whatever I'm doing. Because I think that, um, and this is where we, we hear a lot about Thiesa's work as being, or your work as being um, community organizing and all this kind of stuff, but it's art. You're, you're defining yourself as an artist, as an art practice. Um, and I think that that's really important because art can, can do something that, other, that community organizing cannot do. And we can go probably at length about what that is. Um, I think that one thing that it does for me um, in a reflective manner is that, um, like all, inf I believe all, information organizes people around it in a very particular way. So every piece of information requires a different kind of organization of the bodies um, around it. And I think art is similar in that way, that art um, organizes bodies, bodies, people, identities. Um, but for me, it's always important that when we talk about these abstract theories, um, particularly in universities, that we don't forget that all of them only exist within a body and within the, the complex, messy, beautiful, um, explosive experience of a body. And so art, in a way, for me then, becomes this, this con self-conscious thing that organizes bodies. Um, but not only, and that is something we discussed when we were in Chicago, it's on the one hand side, it organizes its audience, but also it organizes its makers. So it's, for me, I had this image and I couldn't find a good one fast, like that did that for me where you, the art is kind of the prism in the middle um, that, that, that projects and organizes on the one hand side, the mode of its production as Benjamin, Walter Benjamin would call it, or the people that actually make it. And then on the other hand, um, it produces, uh, it organizes the, the audience that, that views it. And, what is important in the artwork is that we can see from both sides the other side of it we, if we pay attention. And um, this is, I wish this, would, I'm just gonna let this run. This is just some organ, modes, bodies organized and not organized. Um, so having said that, then if we look at, if we look at, um, at the particularities of different projects, I, I mean, for us here in New York, we couldn't help, I think nobody can help but think about your work in dialogue with um, the Hirschhorn's project up in the Bronx. I don't know if you had time to go there. Um, and there's, there's interesting, and I have some pictures of that, different bodies, communes, you know, like histories of bookstores. Um, of course, wonderful, amazing project, Row House, Woman House, different communities organizing themselves and the artwork become this, I brought this in because I feel there's n not necessarily, there's art on the wall, um, but what I also think is the performative gesture that becomes this kind of thing that organizes in both directions. Um, the, here, here, Sharon, here we have him. Um, what, because I was thinking about, I was really, when I came up, when I went up to the Bronx a couple of times, I was, really reminding myself like using um, Black Cinema House as a place to sleep overnight, which is not, 
its usual use, I think, for visitors, um, but to kind of like just find myself staring at these intricate de details of craftsmanship that that um, went into that building. On the one hand side, you walk in there and you're like, wow, this looks like the cover of modern living with sustainable materials, and it's not necessarily what you expect. And um, But then you realize, the longer you hang out there and the longer you listen to people, that the, the joints of the, the wood that meet are, are actually my little um, entryway, my little keyhole in understanding the modes of production that produce that joint um, that holds this structure that then becomes a cinema and so on, a community organizing together. So then I go to, to the Bronx and to, to first house housing and um, I see tape and cardboard and I, what I see is also the modes of production and this is where I'm gonna stop myself from um, a critique that I would have of Hirschhorn in, in the sense of um, this like questions that my students so bluntly ask is like, why does, why does art in, in kind of uh, underprivileged communities always has to have a trashy aesthetic? You know, what's that about? Like, why do we do that? Why do, do those material belong there and other materials belong to another place? And it made me think about back of my first impression walking into Black Cinema House that there's something about um, the legibility of, of materials um, that we can learn more about the artists um, than, than we are even having scratched. I think today, I mean, I wasn't here for the first panel, but this, the kind of commitment to, to um, how labor is organized to get to this object, you know, in a, this, this transitional object through which then the emotions get communicated from one end to the other. And I mean, Theesta knows, we, we had a long deb debate about the, the kind of the studio that is huge and the gender politics that inform it. And I mean, I for a moment I wanted to talk about that, but I, I think it's important to note them and it's important to be aware of them and what that means, but it, it would be wrong to kind of bring them forward as the critique of the project, because that's not the critique of the project that you have, but it's more, um, again, these modes of the, where we have, you have to, or one has to look at one's own art to reflect, to see through the prism yourself, what are the modes of production that organize that object? And and can I can I improve that or can I, can I work with that? And I think that is what, what makes a good artist to continuously look through one's own prism, to con prism, so continuously look at through one's own art at these two spectrums of organization. Thank you. There it is. Um, thank you, uh, panel, the other panelists. My name is Lydia Matthews, and um, in thinking about this, um, in terms of what our project today is, um, and specifically around organizing and mobilizing and the way in which we understand those terms and those practices from a multiplicity of disciplines. I think one of the things that has really been the great gift and the challenge um, for all of us who had the you know, great privilege of being able to meet the Aster and go to uh, the space and really experience it on a bodily level is that um, we encountered not only the space but each other and each other's way of understanding and knowing. And so some of the challenge actually is to think about how transdisciplinary dialogues actually birth, if you will, other kinds of possibilities. And how a lot of this is about um, the exchange between our own notions of what organizing and mobilizing mean um, based on our own practices. And I think we already started to hear some of that um, so far. So I'm gonna come at this um, in a way as a kind of call and response because I had the benefit of having a little preview of what um, uh, 
these folks were going to say today. And so I thought, well, how would I respond to those things? And how would I think about the way in both um, in visual culture, uh, critical visual culture practice, you know, both in terms of art and design discourses, you know, how do we begin to borrow metaphors that are useful from one field and use them in another? Or how does the way in which um, the ideas that are shaped by particular practitioners, as we heard Mark talk very eloquently about today, really challenge fundamentally what we've believed thus far. So um, in doing that, I, I thought I'd bring a few, a couple of ideas to the table that have been a big part of the worlds that I um, operate in in design discourse. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that one term that's quite popular and, um, and quite useful, I think, is this idea of wicked problems. Um, and it, that pro uh, term was actually born out of a transdisciplinary dialogue between a sociologist and an urban planner at the University of um, California in 1973. And basically what this was about, which I think is partly what we're dealing with really um, today, is that the whole idea of how we define what a problem is, is part of the problem. <laughs> and and that, that's part of what needs to be reshaped. And so the idea of wicked problems, as um, Riddle and, and Weber talked about it, was that these are not, we, we can no longer think that a problem is, is, has a kind of fixed entity about it, it you know, that it, it is solvable um, from any one kind of disciplinary expertise. That the problems we're dealing with right now, whether it's, um, you know, the uh, problems that, like, Theastra is dealing with in his work on the south side of Chicago and we deal with in every major city around the world, really, or global warming, or whatever. The, these, these problems are so multi-dimensional uh, and so complex. And the biggest thing about them is that they are constantly changing. So really, all we can ever do to kind of borrow back uh, from what Katayun was talking about was to understand that those things are always going to be responding to their own specific uh, environmental um, conditions of a particular time and place. So as creative people trying to make interventions in those things, um, we have to uh, be thinking about ameliorating them, but not solving them and having them be done. Right, so it's a constant, perpetual practice, and uh, and I think that that's what's interesting about it. It's kind of like you know the idea of the blob, which is that, that science fiction movie, um, which I often kind of bring up when I talk about wicked problems, because it's like the real. Uh, a threat is that it is always in flux. And so it's a threat if you are, what you're assuming is that it's solvable and, uh, and containable. But if we move away from that model and really see problems as dynamic, as in need of multiple disciplinary expertise um, that we borrow and share and graft onto each other, that's where it starts to get really interesting. And for me, um, one of the ways in which this has played out in um, in design um, thinking, in particular around cities, is a term um, that in some ways references both biology and um, what Kevin was talking about in urban planning. And that is this notion of um, urban acupuncture. And uh, it really goes to the heart of how we understand a city, um, or it could be smaller than a city, but a city, say, an urban space. And, um, and you know, if we use the kind of Western medical notion of a body as a, a thing that has a problem that you, you need to get to the source of, and you identify it, and then you try to cut it out, and remove it. I mean, I think that, in a way, is the logic of some of the betterment of urban renewal that we've been talking about thus far today. But I think one of the things that's interesting in that, um, uh, at least in 1999, um, a Spanish architect and urbanist by the name of Manuel de Sola Morales coined this term of urban acupuncture, which was then picked up by um, the mayor of um, Curitiba, Brazil, uh, Jaime Lerner, and really began to use that as a, a, a useful way of thinking about cities and thinking about them as these, um, these really uh, living, breathing, multi-dimensional organisms. And the reason the borrowing of acupuncture came in is because when you think about uh, a 
traditional Chinese medical approach to healing or uh, restoring the body, it's not um, like you locate the source of the problem and cut it out. You instead understand the body as something that has a system of flows and energies within it, of multiple systems that are all interrelated and connected. So the challenge is really to say that when something is ill or having problems, it's, there's a blockage. And there's excess in one area and you know a lack in another. And so you really make these very small gestures to kind of um, pinpoint and relieve the pressure um, so that those blocks can open up and flow. So this, I think, is a really kind of apt metaphor. And um, I've found it very interesting. It's also been, you know, there are a lot of people who've, who've um, played into developing it. but. I think it's it's really about these this idea of small scale interventions to transform um, the larger uh, in context and it's urban context and it's something that doesn't happen in one treatment. You really have to constantly be doing it over time and you have to always be uh, dealing with the here and now as Andrea was talking about the actual condition of that moment in order to understand which systems are actually blocked in that moment and which you might be able to get to flow better. So it's that kind of small scale gesture that stimulates energy flow. Um, rather than kind of trying to eliminate a single source of a problem. And another I, uh, aspect of this, uh, it's sometimes called urban acupuncture, other times it's been called eco-acupuncture um, or social acupuncture, but it's really understanding relationships within a larger networked system and how the parts impact one another. Um, and that pinpointing um, key locations and situations in a city or a community that can be leveraged is like what you do if you're the sensitive acupuncturist. You know, you, you see the spots that um, can be opened. And, um, you, and it isn't necessarily the hottest spot on the body, but it could be the things around it in small ways that then bring heat to the area and, um, you know, to kind of go back to Theaster's term today, uh, begin to make it um, shift its energy flows. So I think that this kind of uh, encouraging of flows of various forms of capital, and I'm going to talk about Bourdieu here for a second, because I think thinking about capital on multiple levels is really key. Um, that is what ends up enabling a kind of healthier balance, but it's perpetual and it can go in and out of balance and it's not the end of the world when you're out of balance either. It's just an opportunity to, uh, to, um, to move things around, um, repurpose things, et cetera, some of the uh, processes that we really see actively in the Dorchester House. So just to kind of break down very quickly these ideas of capital um, that really came out of Bourdieu's um, uh, distinction um, a social critique of judgment um, has to do with like how do we begin to understand what those energy flows are and what those multiple levels of systems that all interconnect. And I think as Andrea was talking about, it's really artists who have the capacity to see relations between these um, systems that are really quite um, uh, provocative and uh, and rich in their possibilities. But financial capital is the one that always first comes to mind. Uh, that's, uh, of course, an important flow. Um, social capital with these sort of uh, personal relationships and uh, forms of reciprocity, um, networks, et cetera. Cultural capital, um, types of knowledge, skill sets, education that offers higher status in society. Um, and then. Others have kind of riffed off of Bourdieu and said, well, wait, maybe there's more forms of capital than what he talked about. Um, and so another thing is ecological capital. And I think that comes into play of that idea of sourcing and reusing materials, um, clean air, biodiversity, et cetera. And then finally, physical capital, you know, that it's really about infrastructure, roads, railways, markets, libraries, clinics, schools, et cetera. So, you know, when you begin to understand um, these, as if you will, metaphorically, those energy flows uh, through that social body and the ability for creative people to make uh, small 
scale interventions that ultimately over time produce a different kind of uh, you know, um, existence. Um, I think that's, for me, one of the things that I was inspired to think about in the relationship between the three topics that were just presented um, and then open up more dialogue about how we see those things potentially operating within um, the Dorchester House and the Astor's work. Thanks. We wanted to um, to really have this be as much of a conversation as possible and for uh, the kind of call and response and this potential synthesis between things that you heard uh, the panelists present but also things that perhaps would link back to um, other things that have been said today. So I thought I would just open up first um, to all of you um, if there were ways in which uh, you feel comfortable, uncomfortable with that grafting of metaphors across disciplines um, because, of course, we have legacies of things like social Darwinism, which are scary. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, there's a danger in doing it. It's not always a good thing. And uh, um, so, I, you know, I think it's also an opportunity for us to see what is spurred by dialogues like this, but also where the potential pitfalls of it might be. If, if I may, I think I would rather um, do the call and response to the audience, only sure. because I have to leave in about five minutes oh. to go teach. <laughs> so I would hate to not okay. have some communication with the audience. Great. If there is any. Um, well, just just to, uh, to, to try to link it before you have to leave, the, uh, that it seemed to me, because I, I, was, I was thinking a lot about your cell metaphors, having read your text earlier, um, and it seems to me so provocative to place the cell notion next, which also helps to drive the acupuncture meta metaphor. Um, and I, it seems to me if there's a risk, one of the risks might be that there is a sort of naturalizing or a biologization of urban processes or of social processes. Um, that's mitigated for me by the fact that you also talk about cell replication being something that produces cancer. I mean, that, that there isn't a kind of rosiness about, about the operation. So that, for me, was a, another component of the analogy that I found useful. Um. I guess I would just want to say, you know, I only had a few minutes, um, and I would like to at least paint somewhat of a rosier picture, which I brought up the example of microaggressions, and I also talked about at GenSpace how genes are taken out of their local context in a genomic landscape and placed in new contexts where they behave very differently. And one of the things that I think is very important about um, this naturalizing or fetishizing of nature, which is common, um, that nature holds all laws, that we should follow nature um, and forget social construction, is to me the nature culture, the nature nurture is not a division. To me, they are an integrated whole, which is what I think Lydia was trying to talk about with fractious problems and wicked problems. And so if you think about microaggressions, for instance, which I think is central to some of the things that we're talking about with um, revitalizing or re-resurrecting or redirecting a neighborhood. Um, in the same way that your body can go out of control and with cancer, in the same way a positive response, whether it's uh, urban acupuncture or other social constructions, you can actually reverse much of the damage that's going on in the body through environmental control. Um, and I mean built, social, all those different kinds of aspects of capital, but really thinking about it as, as control, it triggers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an important thing for people to walk out of this space to know is that um, in the same way that the urban acupuncture is a tiny point, a tiny change in your genomic landscape can actually have huge effects, not just on you as the individual or the emic, right, how you view yourself, how you see yourself, but how others see you, how others communicate and interact with you, that, which is called the entic, right? So this notion of, of inside outside is a fabric of dynamic flow. It's, there's no separate, there's no boundaries. There's no nature, nurture, you know, nature, culture, like those things don't exist for me. Um, and I think that's very critical. So 
Um, when I hear people saying, oh, you're fetishizing nature, I think, well, I don't see a divide between nature and culture. I don't see a divide between nature and social. To me, they're whole and integrated. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that speaks to your comment. I just um, had a quick question about uh, practices, and uh, especially since the symposium is called The Way of Working, so I'm a student of yours. And uh, we talk a lot about the scientific method, but then I know artists also talk about um, experimentation, and part of their practice might be a laboratory. Or, and you, you specifically talked about recontextualizing the fire hose in, um, uh, in terms of riots. But I, what I was wondering is, I remember in one of your lectures, you said 2003 is old for science. But if we were like in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we wouldn't say, oh, that's a 2003 piece. That's really old. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, we do recontextualize, we do break paradigms, as you like to say, in art practices. But in, in science, it's like that's what you do constantly. So just if you could maybe ways of working. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I think I would just echo what you just said. To me, to me, the the ways in which we work, whether it's in a social science construction or whether it's in an artistic or design process, um, is a constant. I think um, uh, Andrea said a reflection. Right? You're not trying to solve a problem. There isn't a static endpoint. It's a constantly dynamic, ever-changing process that you are constantly getting new inputs, either from yourself or from others, and that that is a reflective process where you have to check yourself. Um, so it's not change, necessarily. I think, Andrea, I love the way you said it's not social change. It's social reflection. And I, I, I just agree with what you said. And I'm not sure if there's something else you wanted to push on. But um, that art seems to have a lasting value. Then I'll pass it to Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> and that biology does not have a lasting value. <laughs> It gets old fast, that's um, right. It I think I think this you works. That. Does that work? Um, yeah, I mean, not all art has a lasting value, and that <laughs> doesn't make it bad art. So that's why I remember that comment that the estimate also very well, that certain things just have to disappear, and that's what makes them interesting and good. But, of course, what stays is is a set of questions and ideas that are just differently activated. And that's what I liked about this idea of if I think about art, I mean, I recently did a whole project on conservation of art, and I think what's interesting is this, this way in which art is a certain, has this potential to make us think and become aware of time um, in an extremely dynamic way that is not kind of sliding into relativism, you know, anything goes, but is actually stays really true and precise to the moment in which we encounter the work. And um, I mean, I had a lot of discussions with, um, conservationists, and I can't wait until they get their hand on your work, which I'm sure you already have all of these interviews of how do you preserve that fire hose, you know, and stuff like that. But this idea of, like, my question was always, like, why don't we allow art to age? And, um, but we do allow it to age, but it's really complex how it ages. Uh, the contemporary kind of philosophy around conservation is that they're trying to remake, or certain field, I should say, are trying to reconstruct the work uh, or return it as much to its moment of making as possible, you know, where other other moments in conservation had different different thoughts about that. So um, that's just as a side note. But what what happens for me when I go and I look at an artwork, even if it's a really old artwork, is that it still works as this kind of prison that it it organizes m me as an audience member and whoever sees it in this moment in a very particular way that of course reflects that moment. So it has this capacity to be um, uh, able to grow through time or that is what makes certain artworks work longer, long term. And again, I don't think that those are necessarily the, the, the best artworks always, but um, that it can travel through time and stay accountable to itself and to its making, right? That the spine, that, 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 that it happens is really um, there. And it also does, I think, at least for me as a viewer, when I, I always think that no matter, um, that it's a collective, to look at art as a collective process. Like, as long as you're not a really wealthy collector, whenever you encounter artwork, it is artwork that is seen by you and by many at the same time. And 
there's part of me that is always aware of that. What does that mean, that this is a collective experience? It's not, it's singular to me in this moment, but it's also collective. And um, the artwork holds all of that in it. And I think that is, that's what is different than science. might push back on that go 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 and say that it's not I don't think it's different from science so you tell um, me, yeah. Justin said you know this paper was old it was 2003 so then why am I assigning it right why did I have you read Evelyn Fox Keller's work about 40 years of language in genetics it's because it is a pinpoint that actually redirects the ways in which we think about engendered biology so for instance the cytoplasm having no role but the sperm and the nucleus having all the roles. And so it really is this biased um, uh, perspective that comes out of these incredibly important historical time points. And so I would say that, that you know, whether it disappears, whether we retire it, it it's important to remember why it was there, yeah. how it was shaped, how it influenced the direction of a particular field or set of questions, and the ways in which we had to go back and revisit it when new art or new mm -hmm. work or new information comes out. And so I, I actually don't see them as so completely different. Um, I don't. I know that it seems like they're different because you don't conserve. You know, there's no art conservation. But there are actually quite a few scientists who would like to go back to the moment of making and hold on to something that was actually easier to explain with less complexity. Um, and that is dangerous. You know, that is very dangerous to do because then you're not being authentic to what's really going on with this complexity of this wholeness. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, I am a recent graduate of the transdisciplinary design program here at Parsons, um, and I was awestruck when all of the buzzwords from our program were mentioned in this panel. Um, and recently I've been reading a book by David Harvey uh, about neoliberalism. Um, and thinking about um, a way of working and in my experience um, academically in the last two years, thinking also about the connection of neoliberalism and best practices. Um, and I think also maybe to speak to Katayun's point about um, different, different entities, I want to say, um, thinking about like the geo body and how political boundaries are formed and how context and time and space are important. Um, I was wondering if any of you had any insights on what the next thing is to step away from best practices because I think many of us in this room will recognize that best practices are what have gotten us to the position that we are in the world right now. Um, and I, I like to think of myself as radical, um, but it seems really difficult to be radical in a world where best practices are the value. And when you're applying for jobs, um, you're submitting for um, commissions, that there's, there's an expectation. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you guys have any kind of advice or perspective on how to step away from best practices in this changing world we're in. I mean, I think it's really uh, one thing when I that makes me think what you're saying is that um, yes, there's the best practices, but there's also that radicalism has become a form of best practice. So, I mean, there was a moment in the '90s where everybody was talking about working in the cracks and working in the fringes, and and I saw, at a certain moment I had to say like I feel like the fringes, the fringes and the cracks are so crowded, um, you know, that I'm gonna go back to the main mainstream. I think it's this kind of way in which, um, I don't know, it's very hard to say something really interesting without being super general. I don't know if I can really go there, but this, this I mean, what I find, what I deeply respect in, in Theesta's work is the kind of, um, it's the, because it brings together all kinds of things, but it stays really sincerely true to, uh, uh, currently like to a, a particular need of a particular community and the implication of that, like what it means to actually um, address that need that then goes beyond that community. So this kind of like sincere commitment to something very specific um, that produces best practices or not, you know, but kind of I think will get you places. 
in in the world. I don't know if that's I don't know it's super vague. But. From a, from a financing perspective, um, I think of it as this continuum that we need you as a radical to be out there breaking ground, um, you know, busting through boundaries. Um, but in order for capital to follow, it it has to become um, you know it, it has to become replicable. It has to become you know very formal and and very consistent because you know capital doesn't like unconventional things. It only wants to follow things that it knows will work. Um, and so um, it, it's, it's very difficult for, and that's why I mentioned earlier, it's very, very difficult for you know, the, the financing actors within our ecosystem to relate to artists because um, you're not doing things in a way that, that it understands, you're not doing things in a way that are very standard, very consistent. Um, but so. art also doesn't always need capital to follow, right? That's the, that's the thing, and that's what makes it different in a sense that it can be extremely successful without capital following anywhere. Sure. And um, it might not be sustainable, but it can be, um, it can be successful. Uh, You're talking about I'm financial capital. Yeah, and also also other forms of capital actually, like the the Bourdieu, and even though I I struggle with the categorization of everything as capital. Mm -hmm. Can I also respond between this brother and Kevin? Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's there's also maybe like I'm thinking about Procter and Gamble or uh, thinking about large corporations um, that that are in involved in you know this this word innovation, you know. Um, uh, that that there have been these moments where, say, uh, a company realizes um, they want to corner the market on an idea. Like we we make radial tire treads, and inside our tires there's cotton, so we're going to buy cotton fields. And, and inside, like you know, we're going to own, we're going to buy out every other rubber plant in the world, so that any other tire manufacturer has to buy things through us. That, right? But there's this like part of the corporate money generating thing that funds an idea generating, barrier breaking, right? That that even these fiscal people realize that they need weirdos. Uh, at some part, some part of their arm needs the unregulated. It, in fact, uh, Argonne Lab at the University of Chicago. You know, places where scientists are funded to do things with no ambition of what the end is. Mm -hmm. That 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 in fact, our country values radical thinking, and corporations take radical people all the time and lock them up to just play with widgets and draw and do weird things um, until, the corp until these corporations figure out how to monetize that weirdness. Now the weirdos just kind of want to be weird and they're like, wow, you're gonna give me $200,000 to just do whatever I want and I can just make up things and I don't have to think about what it's in game is. In some ways I feel like that's almost a relationship between artists and galleries. That there's a way in which it's like, hey, you know, I got these weird ideas and I can like do this stuff. And then a gallery says, oh, that is awesome. We know all these people who would be interested, this market that would be interested in your weird things that you don't know what to do with. And it's like, yeah, well, I just want to concentrate on the things that I do. You know, I want to think about the things that I love. I want to be spiritual. I want to believe. And then you could do all that capitalist dog devil stuff, <laughs> right? And I just think that there, there might, there, there has to be, if we're gonna, if, if we're gonna really kind of be, be whole and transparent people, we gotta figure out a kind of, a, a way of accepting the fact that we live in this place, in this moment. And so, and so people will say that there's a certain kind of not-for-profit leader who's amazing. That, but in fact, that not-for-profit leader makes millions and millions of dollars getting money from family foundations that have done horrible, horrible things in the past and have a lot of money to show for it. And they become the kind of cool, grunge, radical, not-for-profit leader. It's a capitalist corporation that gets money from a capitalist entity that is, is not only, it, it generates $200 billion and then it gives it's tax write-off, uh, you know, it, it's a, and so I think that there are these ways in which if we were to actually really complicate economy, if we were to really talk about ecology, that we, we realize that, that all the time, 
we need some of that heat from hell as much as we need some of that heat from the sun. And that there's this kind of, uh, what I found, this horrible realization that uh, uh, certain forms of protest and radical communism, it only happened because there was, there was also some capital somewhere that nobody was talking about. Mm -hmm. That the Black Mountain hippies were, were getting that cash from the, the Hampshires and that they were saying, we'd like to encourage radical thinking and we need your money so we can train your queer kids on how to be better queer people in the world. And so, 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 uh, so what I struggle with then is, is at what point, uh, like Bauhaus, when do you take the master technician and the master artist and marry those things? Right? At what point do we, fig do we really do the hard work of saying, these are great ideas, how do, how do we fund them? If, if we care about people who are, are not doing very well, um, everybody cares about people who are not doing very well. But, but not everybody has the capacity to think about that in a way that, that um, allows you to continue to have dignity and not become some kind of white missionary buttfuck, you know? So, so whatever, those, whatever those things are that, God, I keep cursing. I keep saying I'm not gonna curse. <laughs> but, but that gra- what you said, though. Yeah, right? But I, I, but I, I, but I oh, yeah. But I, so, th so then the thing that I keep asking of the new school is how do we, in our training, um, teach both the, the studio practice which is a necessary set of skills, and then um, those other practices that allow the 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 house the, the the house tidy cat to go out into nature and actually continue to fend for itself to to you know and and so this marriage of of and again sometimes you just need to train weirdos to be weirdos and be in your lab and whatever but I think that weirdos if if weirdos knew. Um, what was on the other end of their weirdness, then, then maybe the weirdo would have had a little bit more ethic and not created a neutron bomb. They would have done something else with that energy. And so it's like, it's, it's like you can't separate weirdoness from ethics and from space and from real people and from politics. And if we're only t t saying that you're a pure scientist and that that's all that matters, then I think we're doing a disservice to any weirdo. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> yeah, dog, you want to move to Chicago? I think um, I want to I wanna, um, kind of add, not so much argue against, but add to what you said, Theaster, though, is that what we, I'm total agreement, like we need to integrate what we do in universities. But the other thing I think that, that I, and I'm going to sound really old-fashioned, daughter of a unionist, German, European-ish, <laughs> that um, what I'm really missing in this discourse is is this there is a in this country is this accumulation of capital to a certain in a certain level that is extremely important um, and the only goal like the discourse that I grew up with when I studied art in Germany was um, this fight for a living wage and that that is uh, an, an achievable in kind of level of 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 working uh, as an artist and producing or creating economies creating communities. Um, on the level of an idea of work of a living wage um, that is outside of this you know one end of the art world which is the gallery system which is only just one kind of the art world actually um, and I feel how can we bring that discourse into that space everybody always thinks like I'm crazy but um, why you, what does it what is actually a living wage what does it mean to feel safe um, your family is safe you have a house you have a job you can make your work um, and you don't need to accumulate endless amounts of capital and endless amount of, also, you know, in an art system um, audience. Like, what happens if you don't want to go that road? Um, and how can we make sure in our education that all of these levels of engagement, I mean, Theasa, you are in a very kind of, you, you, you come from bu business, you hang out with business people from the very beginning, so that's kind of your goal, and you're going into a level of capital that's super interesting to tap and work with, and you're doing it successfully. And then there are other projects that um, work on an intermediate level, and then there's a project that works maybe on a kind of three or four family level. What does that look like? And how can we associate equal value to all of these systems? Even though this here, you know, is always the loudest. You know, it's always the one that is perceived and therefore easier 
easier maintained. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy in that way, right? So let's let's play that out a little bit more, Karen, because I yeah. think this is great. This is the this is the challenge of our pedagogical problem is that if we are going to uh, teach these emerging fields and then we're going to send our young people out in the world, then whatever the counter narrative or parallel narrative is to the gallery, just yeah. say the gallery is a machine that cares. It doesn't have to have a, an ethic beyond making money. Mm -hmm. But what are the other um, machines then? What are the other apparatuses that we are to deploy if we decide we only want to work outside of the gallery? We mm -hmm. only are interested in working outside of the market that there should still, then it might mean like I have to learn how to farm. Mm -hmm. Or I may have to learn how to use a certain machinery in order to make the, you know what I mean? That, that you might actually, I'm gonna say, return to, revert mm -hmm. to a, a, a guild, a communal, an agrarian, exactly. that, 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 that we might have to find ourselves adopting other models that were, in fact, historic models in advance of a cultural reproduction, Benjamin moment. Or, mm -hmm. I know we're out of time, so I just want to say, because there are other people who want to talk more, please come tomorrow, because this is exactly the topic um, that we'll be exploring, is how to tr take these ideas that have bubbled up um, through our looking today and think about the implications pedagogically and think about how what it might mean for us uh, you know, as an institution in the future. So I hope you'll come for the, that. Thank you. That's